Hey everyone, this is Ari Yu, Chair of the U.S. Blockchain Coalition and host for Windshield Time and the Blockchain Underground. Uh, today we had a really great AMA with Dennis Porter of the Satoshi Action Fund. Um, he does a lot of lobbying and uh, policy making work across the country, helping Bitcoin mining policy specifically. So this was really, really great. I hope you learn as much as I do, and I hope you'll join us. Remember, we have these every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific now. And also, don't forget, I teach a course with Steve. Um, and it's called the uh, Bitcoin Blockchain and Crypto Fundamentals. So if you want something that's really quick and easy, we've done all the work for you to curate it and squeeze it down into an eight short hour course. Um, I used to teach this as a 12 week full time course, five days a week. So you're getting all the best of the best in eight hours. Uh, just click on the QR code and uh, check it out. Uh, ping me if you have any questions anytime. Hope to see you at our next AMA on Fridays from 2 to 3 p.m. Thanks, everyone. Bye. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this great AMA with Dennis Porter and the Satoshi Action Fund. Uh, we're going to kick off with some introductions of Dennis, and then we'll uh, leave it open up, uh, open it up to the community for. Uh, uh, questions. Uh, just make sure you use the raise hands function at the bottom of your screen and or pop it into the chat. But uh, thank you, Dennis, for joining us today. Uh, it's really great to see you. Um, great geez. to see you again, too. So I know we chatted before, but for those that haven't met you before, tell us about yourself. Like, how did you get into Bitcoin? And then um, how did you decide to just dedicate your life to it, uh, especially with the Satoshi Action Fund? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I got into Bitcoin in uh, 2017. Uh, I was kind of uh, in between jobs at the point, right? Because I was kind of retired at the time. I'd helped my partner build up a, uh, a fitness studio um, and had a lot of things going on in, in my life. And so at, for a little, all of a sudden though, for a very short period of time, I had nothing going on. Uh, and a friend randomly one day said to me, you know, there's this money, it's like this anonymous internet money and you can, it's untraceable on the internet. And I said, you know, bullshit, like that's not possible. Uh, and so I started to look into it and research it and quickly found out that it is not totally anonymous, but also found some other interesting components to Bitcoin that I did like. And I started to listen to Andreas Antonopoulos a lot and read his book multiple times before I really understood what the hell it was even saying, because it was like a foreign language to me. Um, I, 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 I tell people I'm not just a high school dropout. I got my GD, but I'm also a college dropout. Neither of those worked for me. So uh, <laughs> I'm not very technically savvy. Uh, so I tend to have problems with big words. And uh, there was a lot of brand new big words in that book, but really was just so drawn to the capabilities for Bitcoin to have an impact on a social level uh, and an economic level for people in countries where they've never had access to financial services before and to potentially solve a lot of the problems that are downstream of the money today that we face. Uh, from there, I decided to keep researching, keep reading. I was totally not on Twitter or anything like that. I didn't even know there was a, you know, Reddit, Twitter, talk forum, podcast scene. I just found this thing that I thought was cool and started researching it. Uh, shortly after, um, I got into mining, started mining Bitcoin and okay. was mining it for some time. I, um, very small scale, but I taught myself how to do electrical work and how to, which I will say, sh sh should caveat there, I will never do electrical work ever again after <laughs> teaching myself how to do it and trying to do it a little bit because I almost killed myself a couple of times at least. So uh, always hire a uh, professional for electrical work was my uh, suggestion. <laughs> if you're doing anything other than changing a light bulb or uh, changing a light fixture. Uh, two, 220 volts is uh, quite a bit stronger than the, uh, the normal stuff that we used to out there. So got into Bitcoin mining, uh, was really enjoying it. Thought I was going to go all in on Bitcoin mining, like just YOLO my entire life and all <laughs> resources into it. Um, and my uh, partner at the time was like, you know, she's like, 
she's like, you don't even know what you're doing. Like, this is crazy. And this, this is way too, te- this technology is way too new and you don't, you don't understand it very well yet. You should take time. Um, she might've been right uh, in the short term because the bear market proceeded to set in and I would have probably bought all of my machines at the highest point in the market, which would have been absolutely devastating. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure my relationship with her would have survived that. So, uh, <laughs> so I decided to put the mining on pause and just kind of focus on learning more about Bitcoin. And also during that period, during that stretch, I decided to get involved in politics. I've always been obsessed with politics kind of to some extent, like my, I grew up with my dad listening to talk radio and, you know, we'd go back and forth talking about the different viewpoints and why one thing's this way and why they're wrong about, you know, things the other way. And um, always was just fascinated by the, the premise of running for office and people that are in power and kind of how they have control and, you know, good leaders and bad leaders and why they make the decisions that they do. So eventually, uh, after kind of putting my Bitcoin career on pause, decided to get into the political world. I got trained to be a campaign manager. I went on to help four different campaigns. I did uh, opposition research, uh, adv- just advisory role and, and campaign management. But that came to an end when uh, the pandemic hit. I was I was campaign manager for a long shot campaign that was highly dependent on door knocking. And because door knocking became impossible uh, due to the pandemic, we decided to pause that and uh, not pursue that endeavor. Uh, there would have really been nothing there for us. From there, we're about in 2020. Uh, start to, you know, Michael Saylor's getting on board with Bitcoin. Everything's, the, the excitement has kind of started coming back. 2021, I decided to take a shot and try something new with Bitcoin. And that was to kind of start talking about it uh, with the eye to possibly start a podcast or a show of some sort. So got on Clubhouse, January, 2021, started talking, uh, quickly realized that my fear of public speaking was way worse than I ever thought it was. Uh, and it took me some time to overcome that, but just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and I've you know since overcome the problem completely but launch a show eventually launch a podcast fairly successful I wouldn't say it was the most famous podcast in the world but was able to get a lot of great guests and have great conversations and expand my reach and my connections in the space um eventually I kind of started to take a look at what was evolving around me and decided that you know I think bitcoin is going to become a very popular political issue I, I took that bet in early, like probably maybe like April of January or April, excuse me, April of 2021. And from there proceeded to start helping some campaigns. I was very involved with several campaigns, trying to help educate them on Bitcoin and, and how they could integrate it into their, their campaign, I pushed a lot of campaigns to start accepting Bitcoin uh, and actually was a part of some of the first campaigns ever to accept lightning as payments for their campaigns um, as part of the open node effort to get that pushed. But from there, the I don't see August, August of that year was when the crypto tax reporting amendment dropped, and I decided to shift my perspective and my approach to politics to the policy side, and that's when I really started focusing on educating elected members of Congress. Did some educational calls of Orange, Orange Pilda, a member of Congress, and then from you know decided to say, hey, you know, how can I be most effective? Uh, a couple of different organizations approached me with maybe potentially saying like, Hey, come work with us. Let's, let's collaborate. Let's have you on the team. None of that worked out. And so just kind of paused and waited and eyeballed how I could continue to be most effective, started to really understand that Bitcoin mining was the area that needed the most political protection. Bitcoin mining has just broadly been under attack all around the world. So, you know, China banned it. The European union is trying to ban it. We've got members of Congress today who wrote letter, uh, six senators wrote a letter to, uh, the EPA talking about the energy concerns around Bitcoin mining. So uh, we have that, you know, with Elizabeth Warren, Jared Huffman trying to lead that that charge. Uh, New York uh, trying to ban it. Obviously, that bill got whipped, you know, quite a bit um, taken down. The teeth got taken out of it, but it's still nonetheless trying to regulate the end use of electricity there with Bitcoin mining. Um, Washington, Idaho, some provinces in Canada have all tried to raise rates. Are are already have raised rates on Bitcoin miners. So just Bitcoin miners are under attack all over the place. And so I said, you know, we need an organization that is going to go fight for Bitcoin miners and not just to be on defense, because there's a lot of great organizations out there. Uh, You know, I I work closely with the digital chamber, with the blockchain association, 
and various other state level organizations, including some people on this call I've communicated with. But uh, a lot of the efforts in DC have really been defensive focused. And for me, that is good. You need a good defense. But because of the size of this industry, which is small, it's very nascent, and the level of attacks, which are large, coming from some of the most powerful people in the world, it's put Bitcoin mining on its back heel. And it has put it into a purely defensive posture, which in my mind is bad. I think that we need to go on the offense, just like if you're playing a video game, you're playing a soccer match, doesn't matter what, whatever your favorite game is, <laughs> I'm sure there's some sort of like, you know, offense and defense associated with it. And if you don't have an offense, you can't score your own points. And so I think Bitcoin mining needs to start scoring its own points and not just focus on defense. So that's the purpose of Satoshi Action Fund. We're going to be going on the offense for Bitcoin miners by educating regulators and policymakers on the benefits of Bitcoin mining. And the best part is like, you don't even need to understand Bitcoin to understand jobs, innovation, investment, benefits to the grid, right? And that's what Bitcoin mining has to bring. And so having a lot of great conversations with state policymakers and even regulators on the benefits of Bitcoin mining, talking to some utilities, even folks that are working at power companies and really excited about the potential future for folks to really see Bitcoin mining as a positive and uh, start to integrate it as deeply as possible. The end, the end game is to decentralize Bitcoin mining out of Texas as much as possible, but also just decentralize it broadly across the entire world. So uh, that's, it. that's it. That's pretty much the background. That's, uh, that's me and that's the purpose of Satoshi Action Fund and happy to answer any questions if you guys have any. I have a few to start off with. I, I, I'm sitting here going like, which one should I begin with? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I guess one question is you said, uh, DC and generally the Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining space is generally defensive, so generally reactive. How are you planning to go on the offensive with the Satoshi Action Fund? What does offensive mean and what does that look like? Yeah, it, that's a really great question. And it's 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 hard because it can be difficult to determine what is offense and what is defense. Mm -hmm. um, to me, almost I mean, I don't know about everybody's efforts, so I can't, I apologize if I offend anybody here in your own state efforts. Um, I'm, I'm just getting to know a lot of the uh, people on this call. And so, um, but from my perspective and from what I've seen, everything that we do is defensive in nature so far. Uh, what happened in New York, that's a clear case, right? Got attacked, mm -hmm. went on defense. In that situation, even if uh, the governor of New York doesn't sign the bill, it's not a score. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't score a point. We just prevented them from scoring a point. So it's a defensive action. Um, letters that have been sent, a lot of these letters that have been sent to members of Congress, dispelling the narrative that it, Bitcoin is bad. And that, you know, the BMC even to some extent is, is a organization focused on convincing the public and convincing, uh, I think, uh, executives like uh, in certain companies, in particular, Elon Musk, uh, that uh, Bitcoin mining is not bad. It's good. It's it's uses renewables and all this. It's kind of like all reactionary, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't seen anybody going on offense yet, but for Bitcoin mining, there's been other ways that the space has gone on offense. Like that's definitely happened for, to be clear. So just particularly with Bitcoin mining, we don't see anybody going out there and fighting for, for policy or fighting to, to educate these regulators and these policymakers on the benefits of Bitcoin mining. It's always just like, oh, um, no, actually, this is the real story about Bitcoin mining. And it's actually really good this way. Like, I'm not even coming at it from that angle. I'm going into states and saying, Bitcoin mining brings jobs, brings investments, brings innovation. It's good for the grid. And here's a bill that you can pass to help bring this new nascent tech infrastructure to your, to your home state. And that, to me, is going on the offensive. Because we have 50 states in this country. And you have New York over here. You have... Um, you know, probably, you know, essentially even like the DC and the Biden administration kind of over here. Uh, and then on, you have what, that, what, that county in Washington, what is it? Uh, Chilean area? Chilean. 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 How does that how you pronounce it? But, uh, you know, that regardless, you have people over here who are trying to fight and suppress Bitcoin mining. And then over here, you have, you know, you have Texas, right? And you have Wyoming generally going the right direction. However, Texas has um, kind of been fortunate to have a lot of the regulatory landscape already in place. Like a lot of what the reason that Bitcoin miners are there isn't because new laws were passed, but because the system was kind of predestined for Bitcoin mining. Uh, so we have this massive area in the middle, right? Where you, there's, you have two states over here and two states over here, but there's a ton of states in the middle who haven't been educated on it. They don't have an opinion on it. 
they aren't sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And so what we want to do is get to them early before anybody else does and start saying, hey, look at Bitcoin mining. You can bring jobs, investment, innovation. You can benefit the grid if you start to adopt Bitcoin mining now. And so we don't even have to have the conversation. We aren't even, we aren't even having the conversation with most of these people in these states on whether or not Bitcoin mining is good or bad. It's just like, here's this thing. It's great. You should adopt it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, so to me, offense and defense is I'm not reacting to attacks. Mm. I'm going out and attacking and by, and establishing new states that can be very pro Bitcoin mining. I think the, uh, the conversation is generally easier with more Republican red states and the blue states, just because of the, the narrative around jobs and innovation and uh, decentralization of power to the states and things of that nature are really um, catching on with at least the, uh, the more right, right or red states. Um, and the blue states like the Washington and the Californias and Hawaii's, um, we're struggling. Washington, we've, you know, certain counties have raised rates. And so I'm actually in touch with that county that raised rates. So like if we were to like get together and have a chat with that particular county that raised rates on miners, um, how would you help uh, help them understand that what they did was uh, basically send all our miners outside of the state um, and uh, how, why it would be, benefit them to not do that anymore? Yeah, I think the, you know you kind of nailed down on something that is a major concern for Satoshi Action Fund, and, and Satoshi Action is highly focused on maintaining a nonpartisan by and or bipartisan approach to Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. So we do have efforts in um, New York. We also have efforts underway in um, in the beginning phases in California, and I'm in here in Oregon, so I'm talking to folks. But it does take more effort. Like a lot of the places that I'm engaged the most in they're reaching out to me. Like I'm not having to go communicate with them and like try to find out who the right person is to talk to. Like I'm getting called and they're like, Hey, you're, we heard you're the guy for Bitcoin mining policy. Like, what are we supposed to do? Like that's, so it's super easy. Right. Cause I don't, I don't have to find them. They're just hunting me down. Um, with regards to blue States, I think that, you know, and this is kind of a, this is very much evolving in, in real time, but I don't think you can avoid to some extent, that they're going to want to approach Bitcoin mining from a different perspective that in the sense that they're going to want to reduce carbon emissions, no matter what, um, it doesn't matter what industry you're in and Bitcoin mining is just an easy target. So what my goal would be is to say, okay, fine. You guys want to say no Bitcoin mining behind the meter using fossil fuels, which is what happened in New York. But why aren't we also simultaneously saying, okay, but you can get a tax exemption if you're, you know, can prove that you're hundred percent green, renewable, clean energy. Cause a lot of the Bitcoin miners in New York already are. Um, why aren't you saying that, okay, if you, pers- if you provide X amount of jobs, we'll give you a tax break. Or if you do, if you participate uh, in the grid as a benefactor to the system, we'll allow you to get cheaper rates because, oh, you want to perform demand response? Oh, you want to perform frequency response? Great. Here you go. We'll create those programs for you so that you can help be uh, a contributing factor to the grid and help stabilize the grid. One of the one of the main problems. So blue states in particular um, are really going to be interested in policy around Bitcoin mining as a flexible load and at, for its ability to help uh, respond to any the instability in the grid. Renewable energy assets inherently are bad for the grid, so to speak. Uh, because they are intermittent. Mm. The, so the, gri- the grid likes to stay at 60 Hertz all the time. So the power that was created hundred miles from your house yeah. travels at the speed of light and, and appears in the computer screen that you're looking at right now, or the iPhone that you're looking at right now, right? Like it's, it, it's not like it's stored anywhere. It's like, boom, it's made, boom, you use it. And so because of that a relationship, the supply and the demand have to always meet. Mm-hmm. The problem with in, uh, renewable energy assets is they're they're inherently not consistent in the way that they produce supply. Mm -hmm. Uh, And because of this, there's a lot of things that have to be done to kind of compensate for that uh, instability. And Bitcoin mining can come in and perform demand response uh, and also high frequency response potentially is something that we're trying to develop and help to smooth out some of the problems that renewable energy assets create. So going back to your point or your question about how do you, how do you talk to them? It's like, okay, fine. You, you don't want Bitcoin mining to do this, 
-hmm. well, let's do something good and direct it towards this instead. Or if you're saying, oh, it's raising, it's raising rates. Okay. Well, let's create a program where they, a demand response program where mm -hmm. they'd be more than happy to wind down and shut down during peak demand. So that way that they're not raising rates on customers in your County. Mm -hmm. So, and, and maybe this story is true or not, right? We don't know in that County, was it causing a problem? We don't know, right. but it, th there's an assumption that it's causing a problem. Okay. Let's assume that it is. How do we make it better for both sides? And let's not just like kick the miners out because yeah. that's, what's going to happen if you just purely raise rates or that's, yeah. what's going to happen. If you just say, Hey, we're handing down this regulation in New York. The, the thing with Bitcoin mining is that it is not only wanting the cheapest power, uh, the most efficient chips. It also wants what I would call like, like political sanctuary. Like they're really sick of getting like into places and then getting kicked out. And so mm -hmm. they want people to say, Hey, we want you here. We want to do business. We're happy to work with you. And every time someone passes a law or raises rates without compensating to the other side and saying, here's this negative thing, but also we, we still want you here. So we'll do this program for you. It really is um, damaging to the ability or the desire for Bitcoin miners to be there because they don't want to be in areas where they're not wanted. True, true. So from, and I don't, I don't know the actual facts around this, but what I have heard through the grapevine is that Washington is different than Texas in that Texas has those energy fluctuations and they, they need that demand response type of um, symbiotic relationship with Bitcoin miners. But what I've heard that is that in Washington, we're basically very hydroelectric, um, we're big hydroelectric users. So that's already renewable energy. And so that demand response and that instability is not so big here in Washington. Um, so what is the benefit of having Bitcoin miners here in Washington? Yeah. So, I mean, any blue state is always trying to build out more renewable energy. And so what Bitcoin mining can do is in your effort to build out more renewable energy, you can build it wherever the hell you want. And you can immediately have a buyer of first resort there and last resort there to soak up any of that excess supply that's created. And then once the um, once the uh, new renewable energy assets are connected to the grid, you mm -hmm. can start to wind down the, de the dependence on the Bitcoin mining. But that's typically a really great uh, angle for folks. But also um, anyone interested in microgrids, microgrids are difficult because, and this is a, people in blue states tend to like microgrids. It's like really popular with um, Democrats in particular. Mm -hmm. um, there's a real strong desire to, help improve grid resiliency through figuring out how to make microgrids work. Mm -hmm. Right now you have massive West Coast interconnect and East Coast interconnect, and then you have ERCOT in the middle down by itself. Um, the, the West Coast and the East Coast interconnect actually even go all the way up into Canada. So there's these massive grids. And the reason why we built these massive grids is so to help ensure that electricity stays on all the time. So what will happen is like, if you have a mat, uh, one of your uh, hydroelectric dams completely goes out um, in your area, instead of trying to just pull from the local area, like the, 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 the nearby power generation will try to compensate for it. But then that, that the loss of that power supply has to be kind of um, filled from somewhere else. So it'll like, you'll see like there's maps where power goes out and, Washington, and then it spreads as a compensation across the entire interconnect. It has like an impact across the entire grid as everything tries to shift electricity back on to make sure that it stays stable. One of the one of the things that grid operators try to avoid at all costs is electricity actually like being unavailable completely to certain areas because it's much more more difficult to um, to recover from a complete shutdown or a system wide shutdown than yeah. it is to like what they've done, which is built this massive machine, literally like the grid is the largest machine that humans have built mm. on planet earth. I mean, it's, it stretches for thousands and thousands of miles mm. um, and it's all interconnected. So it's a, it's like one of the greatest uh, creations uh, in modern American history. So, or maybe, I don't know, you could say it's one of the greatest machines in, Amer in human history. Um, but, but what they want to do is make people able to kind of create these microgrids so that they're less dependent on the larger grid. Some of that is to help prevent really big problems in times of when there's storms. Mm -hmm. um, 
when uh, potentially there's a terrorist act, but mm -hmm. also for national security purposes. Mm -hmm. And so there's a real big push to adopt microgrids and my Bitcoin mining helps to um, encourage the adoption of microgrids because it allows for a microgrid to overbuild and then have uh, overbuild their generation and then have some buyer there that's willing to buy it up. And then when they're, they need the actual electricity for themselves in the microgrid, the miners can wind down and supply the power back to the grid itself. Hmm. There's, other act, there's other applications for Bitcoin mining. The biggest one in my mind is that is very important is for Bitcoin mining to go all the way up stream, so to speak, to the point of generation so that they can automatically perform demand and supply and frequency response for the grid. Um, currently, a lot of that response is on the is dependent on either changing demand, which nobody nobody wants to do that. Like you don't want to shut people off, like right, uh, or changing supply. And one of the bad parts about changing supply is it causes wear and tear on mm -hmm. turbines. It causes wear and tear on the generation and the energy assets. So mm -hmm. instead of having the supply and frequency response occur at the at, do, on the actual point of generation, you can just move it over like one step and have the miners perform demand response and supply response and frequency okay. response. So if if a Bitcoin mining um, operation is providing that response, demand generation response, who pays for that? Does the, just by yes. bringing the Bitcoin miner to your hood, the Bitcoin mining operation spends all this money like setting this up or is it like, who, who pays for this? Yeah, so this is a really, um, that's an important question because it depends on where you are, uh, depends on the, the region, the the laws in those that area, the regulations in that area. And so we are actively trying to figure out, depending on the state we're in, what are the laws, what are the regulations with regards to whether or not a Bitcoin, or excuse me, a power company essentially can can mine their own Bitcoin. Um, there's, it's, a, it's, it's a, an important question and I don't have a full answer for that. So it really just depends on where you are. Can mm -hmm. a power company own Bitcoin mining uh, machines and, and perform this on their own, on-site, co-located? That's what we think is the dream. People are already trying to pursue that. Right. And the kind of that's where Satoshi Action Fund comes in. If it's not possible from a regulatory perspective or from a, a policy perspective, we want to come in and make it possible. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where uh, we feel like we can be most effective to help ensure that Bitcoin mining proliferates. Because mm -hmm. if you can make Bitcoin mining, I mean, the end goal here is really to make Bitcoin mining so important to the grid that you physically can't remove it from the grid. Mm. Because they're dependent on its on its support as an ancillary service. So there are lots of reasons on why you want Bitcoin mining to come into your grid and set up these mini grids and help with the power demand generation mm. supply, um, help increase reuse of renewables, et cetera, et cetera, and also help with economic development, rural economic yeah. development, um, yes, you know, national security, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, why why do humans want Bitcoin mining to exist more outside of, outside of this energy conversation. Why is Bitcoin mining important to humanity, I guess? Do we need this? Well, yeah, I mean, it really comes down back down to, uh, you know, it depends on if where you're approaching the conversation from. If you're someone who's bullish on Bitcoin and you understand the value that Bitcoin has, then protecting Bitcoin at all costs is important. And Bitcoin mining is the security system for that, for Bitcoin itself. So, uh, if you're at, if you're really hoping to do good for the world, then you want Bitcoin to survive. And for Bitcoin to survive, you need Bitcoin mining to be valuable and decentralized enough to, so that nation states don't attempt to collude and attack it. Thank you. Um, I'll open it up to questions for the audience. Otherwise, I have a ton more, <laughs> but I don't want to hog the microphone um, completely. I do want to hug the microphone, but not completely. Um, please raise your hands using the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom window and or type it into the chat. I would love to also know um, other states, like what's going on in other states and what if people have, what, if people have had any success with talking to policymakers around Bitcoin mining, because I haven't connected with everybody on this call yet. So not everybody in this call is uh, from another state. I think most of us are in the Washington arena. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have at least one Oregon, one California, uh, one Massachusetts, but uh, 
we may have some others that I don't know of. Any questions? You meant to say Mark Massachusetts, right? <laughs> Mark Massachusetts, right? <laughs> um, Marina, you have a question, or is that was that just a joke? <laughs> no, it's not a joke. It's a reality. Since <laughs> our senator was already mentioned by the speaker. Oh, okay. <laughs> um can you give us some overviews of what are some great um top three democratic talking points around bitcoin mining and policy versus top three republican talking points around why <laughs> bitcoin mining? Uh, it, yeah you know i would say that in particular for democrats i i i'm not sure why i live in portland oregon so i i <laughs> wouldn't have assumed this would be a good angle because i talked to a lot of democrats um and, and liberals but for some reason, broadly across the country, the word innovation is very popular to Democrats when you're speaking to them. Uh, I spoke to Ron Wyden uh, several times and innovation is one of the things that he feels like he's willing to kind of like die on that hill and fight for that. Um, there, was a, a, there was a candidate that was running um, that I was helping quite a bit. And when I brought up innovation, she was like, Oh, that what tell me more about that. So I find it interesting. I don't know why that's a key talking point. I, I would have focused on that, you know, Bitcoin mining provides tech tech jobs, which is always popular. It can help with microgrids. That's a popular um, term and it's it's a popular buzzword mm -hmm. with people that are focused on energy policy. Mm -hmm. And also that it can help to monetize wasted and stranded energy from renewable energy assets. It's mm -hmm. very popular. If you want to get into like why Bitcoin is important, I mean accessibility, uh, equality, being able to bank the unbanked, those are all really popular ways to discuss Bitcoin with people on the left, for sure. On the right, it's uh, freedom, <laughs> freedom technology. That's very popular. I've, I, you know, that term has become very much a very popular uh, buzzword on, on the right and with libertarians and then also uh, Republicans um, and talking about how it is going to decentralize uh, government or in the sense decrease centralization of government so uh, return more power back to the states mm -hmm. um, and it's very popular to talk always jobs is popular both sides just how you approach the job conversation is slightly different mm. Republicans, uh, kind of this whole, you know, you can't, you can't take it from me. It's mine. You can't control me. That's very popular with the Republicans and on the right, um, when it comes to Bitcoin and the Justin Trudeau thing is a popular story. If you tell that one, what's that? What oh, oh, Justin Trudeau, like the, with the what? truckers, the trucker convoy, how he like kicked them out of the financial system. So yeah. censorship resistance is kind of like all of a sudden very important to folks on the right for sure. Definitely. Interesting. How how are the what's the approach on jobs between right versus left? Then, on the right, it's uh, just jobs in general, or I guess I just mean to say that like when you talk about what kind of jobs are created, you know, tech, saying specifically saying the word tech jobs is important for blue cities and blue areas. They love to attract tech jobs. So, mm -hmm. um, rule is rule is important to to anybody, but. Uh, the folks on the right tend to appreciate the word rule more than folks on the left because oh. inherently the rural areas tend to be more conservative. Interesting. I would, I would, I would have guessed that, you know, the Democrats would have been more excited about the rural development just because that'd be spreading more of the equitable access to tech jobs. Maybe. That's a good way to say it. That's a good way to spin it. Yep. I heard that. <laughs> there we go. I just throw the word equitable in there and it's, it's better for everybody. Uh, that's, that's a great way. No, it is true though. That's a smart, I haven't thought of that, that it is a, that's a smart way to reframe that. I mean, it really just comes down to framing. If it's everything is just framing. If you can frame it as equitable access to tech jobs, mm. that's great. If you say, you know, rural, com rural communities that have been hurt by big government policies, mm. you know, that's like a Republican talking line. <laughs> the best part about Bitcoin is it, it's for everybody and you can always find a way to make the uh, framing work for both sides. And that's really one of the main reasons why I love working on Bitcoin, uh, because both sides can come to the table on it and both sides have come to the table on it. So it's really fun to watch. Yeah, it really should be nonpartisan, if anything, but, you know, at the very least bipartisan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
Um, Marina has a hand up. Marina, you have questions? No, I just wanted to run by him a couple more things that I think might be useful. Sure, yeah. Great. The Federal Reserve Boston creating CBDC that would be able to control your spending if they get rid of cash completely. Like Great. if you bought too many bottles of alcohol this week or you uh, bought too many cups of coffee or sugary drinks, so you spend our money on something we don't like, we're going to take 10% of all your money away or whatever. Uh, that's one thing I'm curious if uh, uh, it's too technical for the people that you talk to. And the other thing that I was going to ask, well, unless you want to comment on this one first. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll comment. I'm, I'm um, pretty vehemently opposed to CBDCs for retail consumption. Uh, I think that there is a place for uh, cross-border payments for banks, banks and for wholesale usage, but I don't want to be using a CBDC. I don't want to be forced to use a CBDC. And I don't really want the United States to get into the business of using what I would call retail CBDCs, which are just like, you know, average person using it versus, I don't know, if, if the Fed wants to use CBDCs to send money to the central bank in Europe, I don't care about that. That's not a problem for me because it's not an invasion of privacy um, for me. And, but like you said, CBDCs can be used to control how and when and where we spend money. And I think that if you give that power to the federal government, someday someone will come along and they'll use it against people. Um, I was I'm actually, I had no doubt that you'd be against it. I was mostly talking about using it as a, what part of the spiel for people mm -hmm. that to the degree that would be controlled. Or is that, do you think, too technical? Is what too technical? The, the... Uh, to bring up the fact that CBDC is being done and we're all going to be controlled. No, I don't think it's too technical. I think people need to know about that. Uh, the other question I have for you, and that might be even too technical for you, sorry, but um, there is a company on a blockchain that's called Votes, V-O-A-T-Z, and they were implementing voting on a blockchain. Hmm. To make a long story short, um, I had a neighbor who was a friend, and he was a PhD student at MIT in computer science, and his specialty was basically re-engineering the code. And I hit him on his head long enough that he decided to look into that system. And um, they refused to give it to him. So they re-engineered the code and found some problems with the system that voting could be compromised. And when they um, reported on it, to make a long story short, votes has filed straight in the Supreme Court a lawsuit against MIT hmm. that would um, stagnate all of the software development. Hmm. I'm going to post a link. You, you, you don't seem to. If Ari doesn't know, I'm going to assume you don't know. So I'm just going to post a link and, and, and maybe some other time you, or you can tell me or you can send me a note on a telegram if it's a useful tool because um, I love that is question. How do you talk differently to Republicans versus Democrats? I'm going to shut up and just post a link. <laughs> You're good. No, um, I think that voting on a, the blockchain is interesting. I, I, I think that there's been some technical issues with it um, and people haven't been able to solve it. If it's possible to be solved, then I think it's great. I think it's a great thing that we should pursue, but uh, have yet to see it uh solved yet so we'll see where we'll see where it heads but thanks send, send me the link though for sure I, again i was asking a little bit different question i was asking if that example since you talk to a lot of it that you, you mentioned that mentioning the word tech was very useful and so i'm curious if you mentioned that to the people who like the word tech and that it would stagnate all of the software development in, in the united states would be useful as well. That's all I was asking. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't bring it up. Um, I, I purely focus on Bitcoin mining policy. So I only have conversations that relate to how the local you know, jurisdiction can adopt Bitcoin mining from the perspective of trying to bring in jobs and innovation, innovation and innov investments and how it can benefit the grid locally. So I don't talk about voting on a blockchain. I don't, I, 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 I'm like the most niche political organization in Bitcoin right now. Like we just focus on Bitcoin mining. Yep. They're hundred percent on Bitcoin mining only and, and policy. 
yeah, yeah. I, I'm not, I wasn't trying to say that. I was, uh, maybe Ari can help me. Maybe I'm not explaining it very well. I was just curious if that's ex that example shows that we need more of uh, Bitcoin mining. Uh, we need more of uh, um, open blockchains that people would not be able to stagnate all of the tech development. Mm. Mm. Dennis? Yeah, I, um, I personally like wouldn't bring up that point as much. Um, I think that's just like a big government problem of trying to stagnate. But um, if it's if it's hard to kind of communicate, then it might be hard to communicate to like the people on like why it's important or why it matters for Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. Yeah, it might be getting too complicated um, when you start introducing too many new technology ideas. Hey, Francis, you have a hand up. Francis, you want to ask your question? Yeah, give me just a sec. Um, should, hey, what's up? Hello. Uh, so it's really more of a comment than anything else. Um, the, uh, our group, blah, 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 um, our, we had a conversation with a congressman out of Michigan and actually it was more of AIDS and uh, his AIDS. Um, and one of the one of the issues that we ran into, and maybe we just stuck at speaking, um, that they wanted to know about the technology, but really didn't want to know about the technology. Do you run into that? Yeah, yeah. Where, so like, yeah, you, yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. So this is a very big problem, and and I actually diverge from some folks that there was a group that wanted to work with me really closely and I just really fundamentally didn't agree with their approach. And they felt like they needed to like deeply orange pill every single person that they talked to so that they were like religiously like associated with Bitcoin, which is like, okay. That like, if you, if you pull it off, like great, then you have someone who's really on your side, but you're kind of reducing how effective you could be broadly. And you need broad consensus, not just like a couple of people. I, either way, I like the work that they're doing, but my approach has been to really not explain, and it's why I'm focused on Bitcoin mining policy. My approach has been to not explain Bitcoin really much at all from a technical perspective and just focus on Bitcoin mining policy. And, and I'll, all you have to say is, like I've said it 50 times in this call and I'll say it again, like jobs, investment, innovation, and a benefit to the grid and their ears immediately peak up because any state, and I focus on the states, so any state lawmaker, this will work for the um, federal level too, but state lawmakers are particularly interested in bringing jobs um, and investment, and then also an increased tax basis is applied because of that. So I, I don't get very technical with people at all. Um, it can be very, very, very difficult to explain it. And also the biggest problem, especially with members of Congress, is they have so many things that they have to focus on and like the amount of attention it takes to understand Bitcoin on a deep level is high and the amount of attention that they have is low. So right. get, like these like short windows with them and it's just like, 100%. you try to puke all this information out, which is, I've done this before a thousand times, but you try to puke it out and they're just like, what like is happening? Like it's so to, I guess the best, the best way to like, um, get people on board is not to explain how it works, but it's just to explain the benefits. It's the same thing with like the internet. Like I, I, there's maybe someone here, I don't want to offend anybody, but I doubt there's very many people here who deeply understand how the internet works. Like funny enough, I understand how Bitcoin works more than I understand the internet. And Bitcoin's just as, if not more technical and complicated than how the internet works. But like, you don't go around like saying like, oh, this is how the internet works. You go around saying, oh, well, the internet will allows you to send email. The internet allows you to, um, have a website where you can uh, market your company and and allows you to communicate with people broadly. Like that's people hear those words and like, oh, communi increased communication, marketing, those are good things. Like I like those. You almost just need to. It's kind of sad, but you almost need to just like buzzword the shit out of like elected officials. Like you just buzzword them to death. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I was thinking. It was like, all right, focus on utility. Yeah. What, 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 what can what can it do for you and your state, your constituents? and just kind of nail that. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, yeah, it's probably a really good thing that you're so niche because that way you can, you can serve as a subject matter expert of like, let's, you know, yeah. 
and then very precise questions you know you can be like oh yeah that's my wheelhouse man rather than trying to be like master of of all trades and that kind of thing because then i think it it is very difficult and i and i uh applaud the people that are doing that because it's hard to maintain um a, a broad a, a broad breadth of knowledge of everything you're kind of forced to have to bring in experts from all over the world and maintaining that those connections and relationships in itself is very difficult so um i'm i'm feel slightly lucky to be just focused on bitcoin mining policy um and, and it's just, i mean it's digital asset policy right but i'm 90 percent plus of mining is bitcoin related so and even ethereum is moving to proof of stake so soon it will be like probably 95 or 99 percent bitcoin if they ever if they ever merge uh -huh. if the merge ever actually happens and we'll when see. it happens <laughs> right but then even then it's just kind of a layer two on proof of work really i mean not to get all critical and yeah. technical and shitty i don't mean to i don't mean to Are they, I, did they change it because i last i heard they were going to do um uh they're gonna difficulty bomb the proof of work chain are they going to make a new proof of work chain and like i don't know yeah we that we're probably getting very technical all of a sudden but yeah <laughs> We're doing that thing that we said we weren't going to do. Yeah. I don't know. Um, James, James is our in-house DeFi guy, and he said no reason to expect it to not happen. So, yeah, I mean, I think they'll they'll figure out a way to make it happen, but it's um, it'll it'll def. I think when they move to proof of stake, it will it will reduce their dominance, so to speak, in the proof of work area. Um, yeah, yeah. There is. I mean, there's some stuff. Yeah, James. Yeah, there's some stuff already merged for sure. But we mean like fully done and completed, I guess so to speak on here uh yeah but it's nice to be niched out and focused on bitcoin mining policy because we can be the experts we have a lot of experts on our team too we have energy experts well here's the funny part it's like even though i'm niched into bitcoin mining it i have to learn a lot about other stuff so i have to learn about the grid and how energy is made and how that regulatory framework works so it's it's very complicated just like in itself the um like what I call the financialization of digital assets, like trying to make banks custody Bitcoin. Like you don't just have to learn about just that. Like you have to understand all this regulatory framework and have all these people from banks and from SEC and CFTC and understand how it all plays together. And that's very complicated. And I'm like super happy to not be in that conversation because it's, it's, it's not only a lot to know, but it, it feels like um, it's hard to control, right? Too, because like Gary Gensler is like going to do whatever the hell Gary Gensler is going to do. And he seems to be like hell bent on relabeling it like 99% of the industry as securities. So, okay. Yeah. Well, I have a quick question, Dennis, um, going back to jobs, is there, do you have a good source or a good um, factoid sheet on when a Bitcoin miner or mining operation comes to your county or your state how many jobs are created and how much um you know how much economically does it impact that region or that area are there actual hard stats on that sort of stuff that we can there's, pull from and do you have good sources there's like floating hard stats they're not compiled and i've actually told multiple times to miners like that they need to start compiling them and I think that it's a big mistake not to, because even if it's like, they always are like, well, it's not very big. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like it, it's, you're providing like high paying tech jobs to mm -hmm. people in areas where there's like no jobs available to them. So your, your one mind might only provide 10 or 15 jobs, but they're great, good paying, stable jobs. And when you combine it with the rest of the industry, it starts to come together. Like, oh, this is a pretty decent sized industry that I can attract. And also it's like, it's not just the jobs, it's the investment. Um, I know that in the, for the Windstone facility down in Texas, which mm -hmm. is the largest, the largest in, um, in America, mm -hmm. when they, once they expand to 700 megawatts, that, that one facility will contribute $70 million back to the local area in the next 10 years. So that's a massive economic impact. It's not, and it's also not just the jobs that are created at on site. Like a lot of work is done um, through independent contractors and, you know, it's like, for instance, I don't know if you guys, oh, you do up in Washington, you have like Microsoft and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. they always talk about how on site they've got, like, I have, we have Nike here headquarters. They're like, we have a thousand people that work on site, but there's an incredible amount of jobs and opportunities that are created exterior to the 
headquarters itself. Mm-hmm. Like I have a buddy who all he does is do, do contract work for Nike. Like he doesn't even work for them. But his entire, he's, he's like a multimillionaire and he makes money just doing contract work for Nike. True. So True. like the same thing is to be said as like Bitcoin mining. There's a lot of exterior jobs that are created due to the miners coming in. Where do you get the information for like the windstone experience um, example with the $70 million will be uh, put into the area around them uh, for that one facility? Um, where do you go to get that information? Do you just like Google it and, you know, pick up, pick it up in different articles or what's the best way to start compiling this sort of information? That number is directly from Chad Harris. So Chad mm-hmm. Harris is the guy who created Winstone. So okay. I would have to ask him exactly where he found the number. And I bet it's a combination of um, the incomes that are coming in, the tax basis, the construction that's done, mm. the advancements that it's made on the grid. Like, I'm sure it's a very like um, broad number, like, a, you know, contract jobs that come in. Um, they've got tourism coming in now too, because of the people that are visiting that site. True. True. So I don't know how broad it is. I don't know if it's like what it's including, but um, he has said a couple, I've heard him state a couple of times publicly that they bring seven, they're going to bring $70 million into that town over the next 10 years. Might be something I, could, that, I could DM him and ask him directly if you want me to ask where the number came yeah, from. Yeah, it'd be really great. And then maybe that's something that we could partner on, you know, doing some sort of economic study together on, you know, Bitcoin yes, please. economic Im- impact. I would love to fundraise and have someone pay for that. Like, you know, like, hey, me and um, Ari are working together, get a group together and be like, we really need to get an economic impact um, study done. Yeah. And I know one guy that's interested in funding it, but he, um, he kind of wants someone else to do it. He wants this other organization to do it, but they're, they don't want to do it. So it's like, okay. Uh, yeah. Let's ch- chat about that. Any one more last question? Anyone? Adam says, can you comment on why Bitcoin mining needs to be called out and separated from cloud general computing? How is it seen as different from other types of computing used by all companies today? That's a very good question. And it is, yes, it is a problem that Bitcoin mining is being called out and separated from other data center services. And oftentimes that's part of the education process for us with state policymakers and regulators is, is educating that Bitcoin mining is just a data center. I mean, there's two of them right here, right? They're just, little, they're just little data servers. They don't emit emissions. They just spin really fast. Well, and if they're in immersion cooling, then they they don't spin uh, anything they don't have anything they just um sit in the liquid but uh yeah it's 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 kind of a misnomer and i people have lamented at the term bitcoin miner and that it kind of inherently makes your brain think of mining like physical mining and when you think of that you think of like dirty and digging and whatever so it's it's unfortunate but that's the term that we have and i don't know if we'll ever be able to <laughs> switch it back uh, there's there is a lot of efforts a lot of the major like public speakers on bitcoin mining regularly talk about the importance of calling it a data center so mm-hmm. i've tweeted it i've tweeted it about that way a couple quite a few times but it is no different well it's um that's uh i guess that's it for our our time today i would love to uh you know maybe uh, compile some more questions from the community um over the next several weeks and then maybe have you on again or maybe we can uh get you to answer some more and then read them off uh, in one of our AMAs. But this has been really helpful for me to uh, learn. And I really appreciate you spending your Friday afternoon with us and answering some of these questions. Um, And thank you to the community for joining us and uh, learning about Bitcoin mining and uh, policy. And if you know someone or know of an organization that wants to contribute or support the Satoshi Action Fund, uh, definitely reach out. Uh, Dennis, what's the best way to keep in touch or follow or get in touch with you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter a lot. So Dennis Porter or Dennis underscore Porter underscore. I happen to be the most popular Dennis on Twitter. So uh, if you just search my name, I'll be the top result. But that's a great way to contact me. I, I, I regularly look through my DMs. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Ari. Uh, and I, I regularly look through my DMs. If you want to check out the website, it is uh, satoshiaction.io. Uh, we're going to be doing some announcements in this coming month or so. Uh, so keep an eye out for various announcements that we'll have coming. Awesome. At Dennis underscore Porter underscore and SatoshiAction.io. Check them out and follow them. And uh, thank you so much for everybody joining today. Thank you to everybody. And we'll see you next Friday. 
Thank you. Everyone. To you. Thank you. Bye. All right. All right. All right. Welcome to Windshield Time, y'all. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is a non-technical, fun, informative way to learn about money, Bitcoin, blockchains, crypto, and digital assets for busy parents and working folks who are curious about these new technologies. Day, Ari, and their guests talk about these evolutionary systems of money and what they do, y'all. Because what part of your life does money not touch? This podcast is not financial advice, and your reactions are your total and complete responsibility, y'all. Now, thanks again, and enjoy the show. Stuck in sack.